Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Witko Franka Dax Chemical Memorial Lecture. This is the first one. And before I introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce Witko Franka, because some of you may not know him. Witko, this is Witko Franka, 1940 to 2020. And he was a very good friend of mine. He was a chemist extraordinaire. And you will hear from um, Stefan about Witko's chemistry. And as a dirt ecologist, I won't even insult his memory with my knowledge of organic chemistry. But the thing is, he had a background working with his mother, who I actually knew about his mother long before I met him, because she was a world famous forest ecologist. And then I said, oh, are you related to her? And he said, yes, that's my mother. But he traveled with his mother a great deal. And as a result, for a chemist, knew an awful lot about ecology. And that was a fun. But the one thing that Witko did, if you read his publications, which are more than 350, I believe, um, they cover a great deal of terrain. And the one thing that is wonderful is he had a lot of international collaboration with all sorts of people, and he was always available. And one of the things that was amazing with him, and I live in Canada, and he was in Germany, there's usually a six hour difference, and I'd be at home at nine o'clock at night, and I get this phone call, Jeremy, it's Vitko. I'm going, it's three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this gentleman here, Gabo Such, once said, does he ever sleep? And the thing is, that was a very good question, but I found out, yes, he does. And this is what happens. He does these cat naps. It's amazing. He can stop for 15 minutes. He would do this, and he would get up, and he'd say, that's fine, and he'd just keep going. It was really quite extraordinary. And he was a very well-known and very acknowledged, um, acknowledged chemist for all of the work that he did. And I had the pleasure when I was actually president of the Royal of the, of the uh, ISCE to give him the uh, a silver medal in uh, Chile. And this is a picture of both of us. He and I were uh, quite good friends then as well. But the other thing that he was well known for is being advisor both to national and international um, students. And he, the one thing I was always amazed when at meetings like this, the amount of time he would spend with young upcoming chemical ecologists and talking about with them about their project and was always extremely encouraging. And so I would say to those of us that are a little older, remember his example and do that. He was a staunch supporter of the ISCE. He was president from 89 to 90, and this is a group of the um, somewhat older uh, past presidents that uh, were active. And he also hosted the ISC meeting in 2002 in Hamburg. And the thing that was amazing, not only did he organize the meeting like this, but every evening, he and his wife Heidi had a group of people home for the house every evening and had these suppers and so on that were quite amazing. And this happens to be one group uh, with a number of quite well-known chemical ecologists in their younger years. But I should say, somebody would ask, what about Dax Chemicals? Well, when there was a memorial service, um, uh, we were asked if we would like to donate, and a number of people did. But there was also Dax as a sort of a family joke within the Franca family, where there was some money that they, they also provided, and probably some of it came from Vitco's consulting. Because one of the things that a lot of people didn't realize about Vitco was that for many, many years, he provided for the society, all the medals that were given out, all the certificates, and they just appeared, grâce a Vitko Franca. Whoa, didn't want to do that. Uh -huh. The thing with Vitko was determination. If he made up his mind to do something, he would. And this is where we were all in Chile again, and everybody was going, oh, we can't climb up there. I can do it, he said. And I always made fun of him going, you can tell him he's, an he's not an ecologist, he's a chemist. Look at the shoes he's wearing out in the field, quite frankly. And he used to get really mad with me when I showed this picture. But the thing is, one example of determination. 
At the meeting in um, uh, jo Athens, Georgia, um, the host was uh, Murray Bloom here, and at his house there was this party where we all had to wear hats, and of course, this is Vitko here and myself here, and we knew that he was very fond of wine. And a chap called um, Clive Jones and I decided we'd push him a little bit, and going, French wine is great, but German, you know, Black Nun, Blue Tower, and named all these horrible wines, and Vitko got really mad. Yeah, I will show you. And the following year, we actually had the meeting at ISC in Sweden that was actually organized by Gunnar Bergström. And here is the Royal Bachelors Club of Sweden. And a very select number of people were invited. And we had the most amazing supper with all German wines. They were absolutely amazing. And I actually said to him, if you will provide me wines like this, I will come and work for free in your laboratory and I'll wash dishes. He turned me down. I think he knew how bad I was in the lab. But there are many other things, and I don't have a picture of him doing it, but Vitko was a very talented musician, as is his wife, Heidi. And this is something a lot of people didn't know about them. This happens to be a theater in uh, Oro Preto in Brazil. He was also a, a very good cook. He's looking pretty, meh, not happy here because for once I wasn't his sous chef, he was mine because we were doing Thai and I must have given him some instructions that he disapproved of and he just looked at me and said, go to hell and carried on. But the thing that he was really well known for was his love of wines. He was absolutely amazing and with his wines and he was very generous with many people whenever they came had these wonderful evenings with him and a number of people I know in the room have profited from it. But the one thing that always struck me, Vitko Franca was a family man. This is his wife, Heidi. They met when they were teenagers, and they were together forever. They had this wonderful young, gen uh, young gentleman here. This is about the age they were when I first met them, Christian and Michael. And here he is as a grandfather reading to the four granddaughters to each from them. And the family was so important to him, and I think I was extremely privileged because I actually became a sort of satellite member of the Franca family, and we traveled in many places together, and here you can see a picture that Heraldo Lima took where we were doing a mango eating because we both like mangoes. But we did a whole lot of things together, and this one, we went to um, uh, the uh, Bo uh, Burgundy region and we were here and this is Heidi and Vitko and always we had a picnic and we would drink the local wines and it was really quite amazing and I have to admit I miss him but today we're going to have the first memorial lecture and it will be given by Professor Stefan Schultz from Braunschweig he was actually Vitko's um, uh, graduate student he has been a president of the ISC he was a silver medal winner in 2020. And without any further ado, I will introduce Stefan to give the first lecture on the impact of Vitko Franca and modern research in chemical ecology. Stefan, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice introduction and the chance to talk to you about Ritpo and I'm very thankful for the ISC or the committee which selected me because you have to make a proposal and then you get selected. So I'm happy and I'm wearing this tie. Uh, Walter Lee all sent me as an icon uh, item that should be passed on to the next DAX winner. So if we talk about Ritko's science, which I will do here, Jeremy has nicely introduced his personality, but today I want to talk about his science. Uh, when I prepared this talk, of what can you do? First, you can look at numbers. As you can see that he has published a, um, a lot of papers, and this is citation tips continuing, and you can count the numbers of PhD students, postdocs, profs, and group leaders, cooperation partners. But anyway, this will not tell you much about its science, so I skip that part. And instead, I move directly into compounds, because Witko was in love with compounds. He was a 
a full-fledged organic chemist, and so we will look a little bit uh, on compounds he discovered and what they can tell us today. And the most important compound class that Witko was working on are the spiroacetals. And so this is important because um, underlying this is this anticipation of structures he had. And what I mean by that, so at that time, it was in the 1970s, there were, he was working on bark beetles, and there were some known bicyclic acetals, which, for example, frontaline or brevicomine are most prominent, and if you look how they biosynthetically formed, they have a precursor, an open-chained ketone and a an diol, and this originates in the case of frontaline from terpene biosynthesis from this precursor and this from fatty acid metabolism from this precursor. So this was known at that time, and Witko then imagined that there would be another type of acetals, and he did so by looking at his proposed biosynthesis. So he used the precursor. Here you have the ketone and the two alcohol groups, and then he said, why, why not do an acetal putting the carbon the carbonyl bond in the middle. So he exchanged the oxidation status and moved this bond to the end, and then you come to the precursor, and then you cyclize this to the spiracetal. And then he anticipated the structure and synthesized these compounds before they were known as pheromones. Nobody knew about the structure. So he synthesized them to see how they behave uh, as in GCMS, that was used also at that time, of course. And finally, he found them, and his proposal would rise. So this is anticipation of structure, and in a way, this is modern uh, monitor today or reflected in this term, which is called reverse chemical ecology, which is doing more or less the same, but on a biological level. You have a lot of compounds, you test them on your system, and you find out what comes out as biological uh, answer. So in a way, it's a little bit related. I would not say that Ritko is a predecessor of reverse chemical ecology, but the approach is very similar. You have a broad range of compounds, and then you look uh, what you can make out of it. And I have here selected some papers, for rather arbitrarily, so which use this uh, reverse chemical ecology approach using receptors on proposed putative compounds which might be behavioral active. Okay, uh, now look at one of these compounds. Uh, the one of these compounds is chalcogran. Chalcogran is uh, the pheromone of the 6 2 spruce bark beetle, Pityogenes chalcographus. And this is still used today in bark beetle management in Europe and is one of the uh, most important compounds of Witko's work, I would say, that found into application. And uh, so this is also the compound on this tie, so this is very connected with him. So, and if you want to know anything about spiracetals, say Witko and Bill Kitching wrote a very uh, good review, which is shown here, uh, the reference is shown here, and there you can read everything about spiracetals. Um, but there is another interesting uh, spiracetal. He worked on the identification together with the Baker Group in England, and uh, this is olean. And olean is important because this compound is chiral. It looks very, very simple, and has this chiral centers. And if you know a little bit about organic chemistry, you're a little bit surprised that this compound is chiral because it has only two different substituents on the center carbon, but it has its C2 axis, so you need only two, not four, as you usually learn in organic chemistry. And that is the pheromone of the olive fly, but with Cerca olea, and uh, Witko and Hartmut Redlich established this absolute configuration and found out with co-workers that the fly uses uh, females and males use the different enantiomers. And also, these compounds look very simple, the synthesis, or here first I have a little bit done the biosynthesis, this was worked by uh, Kitching and De Voss and Schwarz, who uh, found by labeling experiments the biosynthetic pathway to another spiracetal, so it uses a ketone, then does its hydroxylation here, these arrows are a little bit uh, out of place, and then oxidation status is switched, how Ritko anticipated is. The second alcohol group is introduced and then it's cyclic to the spiracetal, or this is done in two steps, about one cyclization and then the other. 
Okay, but what about synthesis? Uh, if you look about compounds, it's always important also to think about synthesis because you cannot use a compound if you cannot synthesize it. And olean synthesis is very simple. So if you want to use, uh, synthesize olean, this is more or less a perfect synthesis because you can buy this lactone here and you put it in base and then you get this intermediate and then you make it acidic and work up and then you get the olean. So this is more or less an ideal synthesis uh, everybody can do in the first lab course. But the problem is this is racemic. You do not get pure enantiomers. So if you want to get a pure enantiomer, uh, then you have to do a lot of more, more work. And Witko synthesized it for the first time. That was in 1984. And this is a sh from this original publication. Originally in the uh, reproduced PDF file available on the web, it's indeed cut off here, so unfortunate. But still you can see that you used glucose, which has a lot of chiral centers, then at least a lot of steps to come here to remove at least one and then you have more steps to remove more and you are left with two and then you elongate it here is different com uh, complexes different uh, synthesis steps and then you come as a precursor which has the chiral center here and an additional one and then you remove that so this is very lengthy synthesis but a great deal because it was the first one and then kenji mori into so it made it a little bit better starting with only with malic acid and then also a very lengthy synthesis also ending up with two chiral centers before and removing it. So and then uh, different other chemists have tried to synthesize and then numerically pure and they got better and better uh, until they get the odimate synthesis. This is from Benjamin List and if you look here at Benjamin List, this is a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. And he published in 2012 this landmark paper, which I would not say brought him the Nobel Prize, but is certainly a, a piece to it, because he could manage to make acidic catalyzers chiral, which can do enzymes, which is uh, yeah, well known, but not chemists were not able to do it without enzymes. Because a proton, which is acidic, is the smallest entity which can react. And to make this chiral, you have to construct something. And he constructed a cave like this with two bonding centers. One is acidic and the other attaching these precursors. And then he made the chiral cavity. And then this reaction takes place in one step with high enantiomeric purity. So you get a three-step synthesis because you have to synthesize this with almost pure enantiomeric pure olean, which is certainly almost very near to the ideal synthesis in the beginning, but now with a, uh, getting to the pure enantiomer. So olean is still uh, connected to very modern science. And uh, I communicated with Benjamin List before this lecture, and he said, uh, he quoted, uh, I knew his pioneering work on the subject and his enthusiasm for the unusual spiracetal was infectious. This a little bit shows the character uh, Jeremy has told before. Yeah, and what Witko also was uh, always telling that these compounds are not restricted to insects, or he looked also at other systems. And indeed, it was later found that uh, spare acetals are pheromones of beetles and wasps and flies, but they are also plants which can produce them, using them as flower attractant, attractants, campanula, cirropegia, or even coffee. And we have also found them in bacteria, for example, in Streptomyces lividans, Jeroen Dickschatz group, uh, identified Chicogran, Streptomyces is a soil living bacterium in two stereoisomeric forms. And our group connect, found olean, for example, we didn't establish the stereochemistry because the amounts are quite small. In a deep sea bacterium, Saninispora is a deep sea bacterium which lives uh, in the tropical area and they put also produce these pyracetals. So uh, the world is full of spiracetals. So um, why, do, why does it is so that these pyracetals seem to be what the chemists call a privileged structure? Privileged structure means a structure which has some, something to it. So uh, maybe something uh, nature has to look at to get it. And 
One idea is that the precursor, which is for an acetal, it's always a dihydroxyketone, is always a precursor of the acetal, um, is relatively water soluble. And the signal itself is more volatile. And this is also the case for spiroacetals. And also for some other compounds, for example, hydroxy acids, you find these lactones, which is a motive we are working a lot on, which is also very volatile. And here we looked up the data, for example, the partition coefficient between this hydroxy acid and the lactone between water and octanol is changes from minus 2 for plus 0.5. The boiling point is reduced, and the vapor pressure uh, is more volatile, the lactone is by the factor, logarithmic factor of three uh, than the free acid. So the volatility increases, and this is probably why so many organisms use these compounds. And the same can be also said for esters, which are very often found as aromatic compounds, and acid and an alcohol are probably less volatile than the ester. So, um, before ending the work on uh, these compounds, I also want to do, introduce some other structures he uh, found. This is the sex pheromone of the striped cucumber beetle. It's very unique because it has this polymethyl chain and this better lactone. And um, this is a very active compound. And still, this is interest today because recently, or in 2018, a paper of Weber uh, appeared in Journal of Economic Entomology, which showed that you even have, do not care about this stereochemistry here. You can have very effective traps for the cucumber beetle. And this is certainly a drawback for application because an enzymatically pure synthesis of this compound is very difficult. So the absolute configuration was dissolved by Bernd Breit, who is a synthetic chemist who uh, synthesized all the enantiomers, or most of the enantiomers. But this new research says that you need only two this, these two chiral centers, and the rest is not important for activity. So uh, this work is followed on. And another interesting compound, Witko and uh, Frank Schröder worked on, are the mimicarines, which are ant, mimicaria and poison glands compounds. And they produce this huge alkaloids like this one. This is mimicarine, which is, to my knowledge, still one of the alkaloids with the most number of rings. It has, I think, 10, 10 rings. Yes, um, there are not much, much alkaloids known. And these have not been synthesized so far. This has been synthesized with a very lengthy synthesis. And there was some disagreement in the literature how these, especially the higher members, mimicarine 430 and mimicarine 663, are formed. And um, the last report from the Snyder Group from 2010 said that uh, is a spontaneous trimerization of this building blocks here. They did it by complicated synthesis. They proposed that and made uh, clear that other proposals that the mimicarine trimerization of this compound is not correct, which was uh, proposed earlier. And again, this confirms the original biosynthetic hypothesis of Witko that was challenged before. That immediately shows that he had a very profound knowledge of biosynthesis and structure. Yeah, but um, this structure is not the only thing he was very uh, interested in. And of course, he is, uh, was very good in structure determination, which I sometimes call structure determination without NMR, which some chemists told me to me, this is not very good, so you cannot do structure without NMR. Um, don't tell us that this works, but uh, Witko could do this. And what he did, he laid a keen interest in mass spectrometric fragmentation. For example, these are mass spectra from original publications on uh, uh, spiroacetals. And he uh, made a very detailed analysis of the fragmentation of these spiroacetals and could explain every peak. And he found, for example, this peculiar, maybe I can go back, this peculiar delta-3 shift between these two ions, 84 and 87. And he could uh, predict structures from this uh, fragmentation very easily. And he showed us that if you look very carefully at mass spectrometry, you can uh, get a lot more information by, than just by comparing it with known spectra. 
And um, we adopted this a little bit because uh, uh, we looked, for example, in mass spectra of microcellular lactones very intensively and made a detailed analysis. And so uh, one were able to identify a lot of new macrolides from termites or frogs or butterflies recently with Paolo or bees, or again frogs from these macrocyclic uh, lactone uh, mass spectrometric fragmentation, and we're currently working on this type of compounds which is proposed. And uh, I've brought a small example from my own research, because I was told I should also talk on my own research during this lecture, and we're looking at the male femoral gland secretion of frogs from Madagascar. This is a very broad group of the Mantellin family of frogs with uh, high species diversity, which are endemic to Madagascar, and the males have femoral glands on, uh, which are used in attracting females. And they occur uh, in ponds with 20 different species at the same ponds, and they all are vocal, but they also are different by chemistry. And in one of these species, we got, or in many of these species, we get this frogolite, how we call it, because this lactone occurs so often in uh, frogs. And you can analyze the fragmentation, and then you lose this iron 68, which could all, this fragment 68, which could also be ionized, and then you get 168 and 109. And if you know this, and you come upon new structures, for example, here you compare this. This 60H makes to 82, and so we, that means 68 must be longer. You do a little bit about higher in mass uh, biosynthesis, and you come up with this compound. Maybe the 82 has this structure. And then we have an additional move from 123 to 182, and you find here the other two fragments are moved from 109 to 123, 168 to 182. And you can do it a third time, where everything is moved, 82, 196 now, and 137. And then you have acyl group instead of methyl groups here. And we have at least synthesized the compound with one methyl group so far, and it, it's indeed this structure. So what this, all this comes up, uh, about is uh, what I call the Franke approach, also it's not invented by him. I would not say that he invented it, but he made it more or less to perfection. So structure elucidation without NMR means that you start with the GCMS, you calculate the mass or analyze the mass spectra retention index, then you do microderivatization reactions, high resolution mass spectrometry, and then you come up with a, a structural proposal based on mostly on the fragmentation of the mass spectrum. And then comes the labor-intensive steps, and you have to synthesize the candidate compounds, and then you have compare the data with the original ones, and then you find out you're wrong. So this means an iterative step, you have to start again. And this can be an endless loop in some cases. So um, a vicious cycle, I would call it, and you never come out. And if you're lucky to come out, you can determine the current GC. So obviously we need some, some more, and we have developed a system now where we also used GCIR, which if you look at original papers of Witko, a very old one, you also see that he had GCIR. He didn't mention much about it, but it cures, pops up here and there during his papers. Um, the problem with the machine he had and the old machines was that the very low sensitivity of the compounds. And especially due to Paolo Sabin, who made it possible, uh, and others uh, who made it popular in chemical ecology, these new machines are very sensitive, which have so-called direct deposition GCIR machines, where you have similar resolution as in GCMS and almost similar sensitivity. You can measure uh, the spectrum, and what we call, you get is orthogonal uh, information compared to the GCMS. Here you get fragmentation along the carbon chain, and here you get information about functional groups. And if you see this structural space as a funnel, you can angsten your funnel and your possible structures are reduced. And the nice thing about GCIR is that you can do computer calculation of the spectrum by up initial uh, computer chemistry, and then you can calculate the spectrum 
narrow the funnel and only com one compound pops out and you have a proposal, you synthesize only one time and not, you do not come in a vicious cycle. And in our case, this was successful um, in a compound uh, which is involved in bacterial communication in Salini spora. If you had the mass spectrum, a lot of possible structures, then you do the ER and calculate the spectra of all the possible structures, and you see one is most similar to the natural one, the other is not so, you synthesize only this one, and in the end you can identify all these compounds as volatiles of the Salonisbora bacteria. Yeah, and what about calculation of mass spectrometry? This is much more complicated because then you have uh, imagine what happens in a mass spectrometer. You get a molecule which is ionized to get a high energy state, and then you have calculate each reaction pass to each ion. And this is a lot of uh, calculation time. So if even have very good computers, you can calculate a week or so if you use normal DFT calculations. Uh, you need bright uh, computer chemists like uh, Stefan Grimme in Bonn, and he devised a way to circumvent these long uh, calculation times. And he calculated it uh, much faster, so you get, get it in a reasonable amount of time, you get the spectrum. And the results here is shown in the upper case, you see a spectrum of a compound, uh, which we measured on our GCMS machine. And this is what he calculated, and probably it's not so well visible, but you see that's relatively similar, except one feature. This major ion here is 82, and he calculated 81. And here it's 67, and he calculated 68. And uh, here it's 121, and he calculated 122. So it's, and here 149 is almost missing here. And, um, the molecular ion is much too high compared to here. So there is some progress, but we are not there yet. So you have to improve this further. And there are also other approaches, for example, from the Tantillo group, uh, who does quantum chemistry, call it for E mass spectra uh, calculation, and they calculated a spectra for metabolomics. In metabolomics, you use a, use a cell and you analyze all constituents of a cell due by GCMS. And because there are so many polar compounds, you do not do it with native cell exudate, but you transform that in trimethylsilyl esters or eaters, and then analyze these TMS eaters, how they are called. And so they calculated not the mass spectra of the pure compound. Oh, Oops, sorry. But on the TMS eaters, they calculated the most likely structure or arrangement of ions and then did a quantum parallel, uh, computer parallel calculation of the fragments, and that's the result. Here you see the in silicio spectrum and the NIST spectrum. It's, uh, that is the original one, and this is the calculated one. It's, it's sure it's not bad, but uh, in this case, but in other cases, it's quite wide off. For example, for this compound here, these ions, which are, in, the, in this case, the NIST is blue, uh, are missing totally here in the spectrum, and the 73 is now here. So probably in five years or so, you can calculate the correct mass spectra. So we're on our way, I would say. So let's get back to one other important uh, area Witko was working on, and this was orchid pollination. And um, he found out in cooperation with the Schistel group and, and others, and Christa is also involved, and he mentioned this, um, this orchid sexual swindle uh, enigma, and they solved it and found out that the uh, Ophris vigodis imitates the sex hormone of Andrena nicroiana, and this is a mixture of these uh, hydrocarbons long chain simple hydrocarbons and unsaturated hydrocarbons. And this also nicely illustrates this. Witko always was very keen on uh, mixtures. So he wanted to know everything what happened in their sample, not only the compound, which is active, but he wanted to know everything. And this is, I think, a very good approach because you can learn a lot about that. 
uh, and ex find some unexpected results. And they also did it in other systems here in Ophrys Exaltata and Caletis Conicalius, and they established this hydrocarbon mixtures as B pheromones. And another uh, orchid thing is other heloglottones, and see. Um, discovered a totally new compound class, and these are these dialkyl cyclohexane dions, which are produced by heloglottis orchids to produce the sex pheromone of pollinator wasps, for example, Neocelaboria cryptoides, together with uh, or pickle groups, which are doing, and Frank Schiestel, who are doing a lot of research on this uh, nowadays, and they established these chyloglottone structures. And what, what they also did, they proposed a biosynthetic pathway to it, which is not so easy how you come up with this structure here. <clears throat> and they proposed that you have one better keto fatty acid, which does a micro addition to this alpha beta unsaturated fatty acid. And then a glycine condensation on the other side of this carbonyl group coming to a disease carboxylated precursor and then a decarboxylation occurs and you are left with the diketo compound. And again, they established the mass spectrometric fragmentation of this um, compound class. And a little bit later, it was found that these compounds also are performed, are used by photoraptos bacteria. Photoraptos bacteria the are bacteria which are living in nematodes, and they use uh, dialkyl resorcinols and photopyrones as signaling compounds. And this is work by the Bode group here from 2020. And they found, you see that the cyclohexane dions are precursors of the real active compounds, in this case, the dialkyl resorcinols. The bacteria obviously did not want a volatile compound, so they uh, oxidized this ring, so if you right here, this is a in enol form, and this is a enol form, you need only one oxidation here to get to the aromatic ring, and then they get the diacryl resorcinols. And <clears throat> the good thing in bacteria is that it's very easy to make all the, not very easy, but it's uh, more easier than in insects or plants to work with the, with the genes and uh, make expression of genes, and so they establish not only this pathway, but uh, uh, characterize all genes in this pathway to uh, working all this related compounds of photopyrone, which is the condensation not with the alpha beta unsaturated, but with the saturated one. And again, you see that this is exactly the formation uh, predicted by Witko for the cyclohexane ion. And just as a sidekick, so uh, because many people probably do not know so much about bacterial signaling, this is uh, from the same paper what is known about of bacterial signals. You can see here some compounds which look a little bit like insect pheromones, like these hydroxy acid esters, but others like these boron diols, uh, or autoinducer 2, how they are called, or these humus lactones, or these peptides are completely different. And here you see the DRQ resorcinols and the photopyrones and some other. And in all cases, in bacteria, it's well known how the receptors work and how they are, these compounds are produced. This is because bacteria, bacteria people have it a little bit easier than insect people, I would say. Okay. Yeah, and now I come to another point um, Witko was interested in, and this is a modified terpene pathway. And Vitko found this compound once. This is the so-called Sodorifen, and this is produced by Zeratia odorifera. He identified it together with Stefan von Reuss and the group of Birgit Piel Schuller. And this is a very unique compound. If you look at the structure, you see this is a seven-membered ring, and here you see a five-membered ring, and here you see a six-membered ring. And every carbon here has a substituent. There's no, no hydrogen on any of the ring atoms. Every carbon is substituted. And this uh, compound for a long time was not known what the function of it is. It was only known that it's a sesquiterpene because it's 16 carbons and one additional methyl group. But recently, uh, here, 
some people from around uh, Paula Gabayeva and some others found that fungal volatiles uh, induce sodorophane emission in the ratia and also upregulation of terpene synthase and other genes. So the gene expression is exchanged by these volatiles and more of the sodorophane is produced. Also the actual function of sodorophane is not solved yet. And this work has inspired Stefan van Roys also to look at the biosynthesis and this was published 2018. And this biosynthesis is, ex is extremely uh, complicated. Here you have this farnese pyrophosphate, and then you did need an additional methyl group, which is introduced here by uh, S-adenosyl methionine, which is a typical methyl group donor in biological systems. And then a complicated cyclization occurs all with the pyrophosphate still on this uh, precursor linked and the first ring is formed and then the pyrophosphate is removed and cyclization occurs a second time and then here some rearrangement and recleavages occur which, which I omitted here and in the end you can up with the sodorophane. So the biosynthesis is very complicated and um, also we do not know the exact function of the sodorophane. It's pretty clear there must be something because um, the bacteria wouldn't do a, such a complicated thing, not without reason. And if you look at bacterial biosynthesis, you see this is a typical terpene biosynthetic pathway, be it mevalonate or desoxycellulose. You get geranyl pyrophosphate as precursor, you get monoterpenes, farnesyl pyrophosphate, you get sesquiterpenes. But you get these modified terpenes, and the modified terpenes are the, probably the most interesting one. For example, with the SIM, which we know now, he introduces here a methyl group, and you get these two methyl isoborneol, which is a typical compound of cyanobacteria and actinobacteria. Or you get with SIM the sodorifene, or you get cleavage of the side chain, you get geosmin, which is also, for example, an attractant of columbola to bacteria. So uh, terpene modification is important for signaling and Witko and we have made a review which is now uh, showing that these bacterial volatiles can do a lot of things. Um, they are relatively fast moving into water phase because they have a very fast, because they're so lipophilic they diffuse very fast in water and all the gas phase and they can int do a lot of things, for example, DNA damage and altered gene expression. And you have, can re have microbial responses in other microbia in plants and animals. And there are lots of known functions which are now connected to these volatiles of bacteria. OK, let's come back to Witko. And Witko also found some modified homoterpenes. In this case, this is some work on the trail pheromone of the and genomtogenis triatulator. He worked with Abraham Hefetz together with it, and they found these compounds which have an additional methyl group again here at this position, and uh, not here. The bacteria had it in here, and the insects have it here. And also, he found this position where you have two additional methyl groups here and here. And this led him. And again, these compounds were similar compounds were found as sandfly pheromones from the picket group, for example. And so they are popped up here and there in insects. And Witko made a proposal that these compounds are formed from Homo mevalonate. That's a little bit different. We have heard about methyl addition in bacteria going about S adenosyl methionine on geranyl pyrophosphate or farnesyl pyrophosphate. And Witko's proposal for the insect is that's a little bit earlier, that's already during the um, first biosynthetic pathways, giving this addition elongated building blocks, which we call homo mevalonates. And if you have an elongated building block and condense it with a non elongated what you get exactly this uh, position of the additional methyl groups. And this has been similarly found in insect juvenile hormones, for example, they also use it. They have these acid groups here in the end. And if we come back to our frog compound, it's very similar. This is, has more or less the same 
overall structure as the juvenile hormones. You cyclize the juvenile hormones, and then you come to the Faulkner signaling compound. So again, you have some similarity between uh, groups of animals or groups of organisms which are not related much. So, and extending a little bit this uh, terpene pathway, we worked um, during the last years a little bit on heliconius butterflies, and we were interested in the mimicry system of this mimicry-rich uh, animals or butterflies, and we analyzed the mimic rings of one species, Heliconius erato, which has different mimicry rings. If you see the different patterns, ring patterns, and we asked the questions whether these is reflected by the uh, pheromone gland composition. Can you also have a difference between these mimicry patterns? And Witko in mind, we analyzed 115 samples and looked at every compound. So this is a metabolomics approach, but I like metabolomics only if you know everything what you're looking at. So we try to identify the compounds which were detected at least three times in the 115 samples, and we could identify 450 compounds. And with that, you can see that it's indeed, there is differentiation, but especially one clade, the Dennis, uh, the distant are highly different in composition than the others, but still the others are uh, differentiated. And this is not an artifact, but we tested this by statistical methods. But among these 450 compounds, they are not all active, of course. Um, we, uh, Paolo and us uh, recently found that one of the minor components, maybe not so good here, this is a sort, so-called phylizolite, one of the macrolides I've shown, is indeed active as anti as is another compound, ozimane, so, but there are certainly more that are active in this respect. And how is this formed? Um, this is formed by, again, modification of the terpene pathway. Um, you have phanesol, which is oxidized to granule acetone, then you reduce the uh, alcohol part, then you hydrogenate the double bond and so oxidize here and cyclize, and then you have this phylizolite, and which is uh, obviously a uh, uh, degraded terpene. But um, to show you a little bit that uh, insects <coughs> are also possible to do more amazing things, the terpene pathway has recently uh, extended by work from Jérôme Dickshat here, published this year in Nature, and um, Ikuro Abe from Tokyo. And they found out that the normal biosynthesis of terpenes, of triterpenes, is that you have the normal uh, terpene biosynthetic pathway, so you get to finally the pyrophosphate. And then two units pyrophosphate are linked together head to head, and then you get the squalene which is epoxidized and gives you the lanosterol, the precursor of cholesterol, or if it's not oxidized, give you the hopane cl type class of natural products. They found out that some fungi uh, can elongate this further. So they have a hexaprenyl and then cyclize it like a sesquiterpene to this new structures with uh, new uh, uh, skeletons by even uh, uh, terpene synthase, which can allocate it to six pineal units. But this can also, insect can also do this. If you look, for example, at heliconius and the compounds we identified, we identified compounds like phanisulfanisine and phanisulfanisol, which are exactly these six units together. And in uh, heliconius, you find everything. You find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units connected together and then transformed either to the ozimane type, this is the smallest, the monoterpene, but elongated up to seven times, or to linalool or phanisol types, and then they also reduce and oxidize to an acid, which is then esterified with a short chain alcohol. So uh, very interesting to also look at all these genes in heliconius, I would say. And this is not the end. Until the end, I come to Columbola, to springtails. Springtails um, use 
probably a sister group um, to the insects, and one could think that their cuticular, cuticular chemistry is probably not much different from those of insects. But wrong thought, I would say, if you look, for example, in this one here, this is Hypogastura socialis. Uh, we identified this compound here, uh, which has a molecular mass of 624, and the mass spectrum shows nothing, and the 119. And we thought that then no double bond is here, and it's highly branched, so we thought probably these are nine units. And this is true, we synthesized this compound, and this is the structure of this particular hydrocarbon from Hypogastua socialis, and it's only one major compound which occurred in this one. So uh, even Kolemberger can do this modified terpene pathway. So this is all what I wanted to tell you. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and my last slide is this of Witko because it's a very old one, and it was the time, at the time photographed there were, when there was no smartphone available, so I please apologize for the quality. But it shows, it shows like Witko wanted to make science. He wanted to collaborate with his uh, biological partners who want to be in the wild to collect things and he wanted to cooperate with his younger partners also. This one is probably not, uh, uh, <laughs> not <laughs> very enthusiastic. Uh, what only missing is the lab in the, in the back. So if you can compute Photoshop, you could probably uh, Photoshop the lab into that. And I hope I could bring you a little bit about the science in Vitco and what comes out of it. And I thank you for your attention. chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, thank you very much for paying honor to this. Ah, do you have a question? No? Okay, we have it. Thank you, Stefan, for that wonderful talk. I have just a very brief question. You very briefly mentioned uh, the bacteria people have it a little easier than the insect people. Mm -hmm. And I'm just very interested how you specifically meant that. I meant that you have all the genomes. You, you, if you have a, have a bacteria, we have a bacteria on our, our lab, which we wanted to investigate some biosynthesis. It's not sequenced. I call my collaboration partner at uh, DSMZ. Can you sequence the bacteria? He said, OK, send me the bacterium. And uh, four weeks later, I have the genome. Then I have this anti-smash, which annotates me all biosynthetic genes. Um, and then I have. Uh, a guy like Peter in my lab, and he looks, says anti-smash is all rubbish, so you have to look at it in detail, and then he comes up with some uh, nice uh, proposals for biosynthetic genes, which might be responsible for the formation of this compound. And then we call Jeroen, uh, could you express this gene in your uh, E. coli or whatever expression system? He said, sure, send me. Uh, results are back in four weeks, and uh, then we know about the biosynthesis. This, I mean, I don't know whether Krista can do it at the same speed. I'm, probably he would agree with me that they have it easier. Yeah. St still ways to go until we can do that with insects. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Stefan, for paying honor to this.